was great. I um, felt obviously a moment of pride and, and uh, happiness, um, but I knew then that it was really the first step on a long, long journey. Um, and I remember thinking to myself that 10 years from now, nobody's going to care, um, and that this really just should be the first step on a, on a journey of making a difference. Uh, and really, um, that's infused with the knowledge that everything I've done is due to my parents, my brother, my teachers, and so um, my contribution should be worthy of everybody else's investment in me. Um, and so I hope I've lived up, lived up to that. I went to medical school before there was internet. I uh, finished my residency before there was cell phone. Uh, so every now and then I feel like a dinosaur. We had our electronic medical record switch over two years ago and uh, definitely felt uh, that I was on the road to being obsolete. Um, but you adapt. Life is about adaptation. Change is the only constant. And um, it's, it's, it's good to have good people around me who can help me uh, not be too much of a dinosaur. Ophthalmology is a great field because you combine internal medicine, general surgery, pediatrics, you have patients of all ages, you have the detective part of internal medicine where you can diagnose all kinds of diseases based on the eye exam. I've been fortunate to help my patients uh, arrive at a conclusion where we figure out they have diabetes or high blood pressure or MS or lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome and we can get them treated for those conditions. Um, and you have on a procedural level a, a, a exquisite finesse where you're doing delicate microsurgery that makes a difference. Um, people value their vision. And from a dynamic innovation perspective, there's been so much research in my own career, half of what I do now, more than half of what I do now, was not around when I was doing fellowship. Um, and uh, so for all those reasons, I think it's the best field within medicine. Um, our biggest contribution was probably figuring out uh, what keeps the cornea avascular, what keeps the cornea clear. We showed that a molecule called SFLIT was the primary mediator of corneal avascularity. And based on that insight, that influences the understanding of ocular vascular demarcation, what keeps blood vessels out of vision critical tissues of the eye. So we demonstrated that that same molecule was important for avascular privilege of the photoreceptors because the photoreceptors are sandwiched between the underlying choroid and the retinal vasculature and SFLT keeps the photoreceptor layer clear of blood vessels even though it's a high oxygen demand tissue. Um, and equally importantly or more importantly we've used that molecule as a substrate to make a small molecule called FLT23K which, uh, when administered as a gene therapy, can result in intracellular suppression of VEGF. And um, this intracellular anti-angiogenic therapy, we think, um, has great potential. We've shown benefit in monkeys, rats, and mice. And we think it has great potential uh, for long-term anti-angiogenic suppression that may potentially be complementary or synergistic with existing extracellular approaches and may possibly avoid some of the adverse effects of extracellular VEGF suppression such as neurotoxicity and geographic atrophy and fibrosis. My mentor was Tony Adamus uh, and um, he was cornea trained but did a lot of retina research and so I've kind of followed in that model where my clinical practice is anterior segment with cornea and cataract and uh, my research spans both cornea and retina because both uh, involve a lot of angiogenic um, uh, diseases. Uh, in my clinical practice I perform cornea transplants, cataract surgery, LASIK, artificial corneas, uh, pterygium uh, removals, anything in the front of the eye.
Time is the one thing that never comes back, so I've been blessed by having a little bit of extra time by starting early in my career. I finished my fellowship when I was 25, and that extra number of years is a gift in terms of becoming established in practice and research and so on. But you're absolutely right, on a year-to-year -year or month-to-month -month basis, um, uh, I, I said I was half clinical, half research, but in reality everything becomes 80%. Um, and um, I think it's important to keep perspective um, that what we do on our day-to-day -day basis is important to us, but um, there's an ancient saying in, in Sanskrit in, from my faith in Hinduism, um, manava seva, madhava seva, which means service to man is service to God. And um, I think as physicians we all take an oath to uh, help people regardless of their financial status. And there are many people in Utah uh, where I live um, that need help, and as well as around the world. Mm. Um, and so uh, within my university we do two um, charity surgery days on Saturdays each year. That will expand hopefully to three or four Saturdays per year in the coming years. Um, and then every month we go down uh, to the Navajo Reservation, the American Indian Reservation, where there's 300,000 people without an ophthalmologist. By comparison, in America there's usually one ophthalmologist for 16,000 people. Um, so you have really advanced cataract and pterygium just a few hours from Salt Lake City. Um, and so I've, uh, that program started last year and I plan to go down to the Navajo Reservation on every six months or so. And then uh, globally I have had the good fortune of working with um, Orbis and Site, uh, Site for the Sightless and Site Life and uh, Project Hope and, and a few different NGOs and um, I think the global impact has to be both service and also training because we're in the business of not just curing blindness, but helping local communities build their own eye care infrastructure. And you want that because you want whatever service you provide to be sustainable. This isn't ultimately about us, but about, help, about helping other communities build their own eye care teams so that they can become sustainable. So we're training the trainers with Orbis, which has been around for 30 years, um, they've really transferred cataract skills. Now they're transferring transplant skills, as, as is site life. Um, and uh, first that was extra cap in cataract, then it was FACO, um, and, and those kinds of skills transfer programs are critical to addressing the backlog of cataract blindness, of cornea blindness, because when you look at the numbers, you have of something like 20 million patients bilaterally blind from cataract, and another, I think, 100 million or 150 million who have significant visual impairment in either eye from cataract. Um, you have another 10 or 15 million cornea blind patients who need transplant. Um, those kinds of numbers, you only have 20,000 ophthalmologists in the U.S., maybe another 20,000 in Europe. Um, so from the, from the West, even if half of those decided to contribute a month of their time every year, you're never going to solve that problem. You have to develop the local uh, ability and capability. And so that is why I really do like to spend um, a few weeks each year um, on these outreach programs, um, not only to do service to help the patient in front of me, but also to build a partnership with local ophthalmologists. And I've, it's a two-way street, because I've been blessed to meet some really fantastic cornea and cataract docs, and so I learn a lot from them as well as mm -hmm. passing off what I know. Up. Absolutely. Ophthalmology is a fantastic place to be, uh, both medically uh, and surgically. Uh, from a medical perspective, I think the intersection of gene therapy and ophthalmology is a hotbed of 
uh, new therapies where I think we can actually start looking at cures for a lot of things that f for my whole life we thought were incurable, uh, dystrophies and degenerations. And uh, regenerative medicine is emerging as a credible uh, potentiality in the next few years, I, I, I think, uh, for end-stage corneal and retinal disease. From a device and surgical perspective, there's been all kinds of new lasers and lenses, and one might think those are incremental innovations, but what we can do to improve people's quality of life now is truly amazing and fascinating, and I think it's only going to get better uh, with the introduction of SMILE, as well as uh, new technologies for presbyopia, um, and uh, adapting that lens technology for helping something like macular degeneration or optic neuropathy. Um, I think there's a lot of fascinating innovation coming down the field. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I don't think I've been asked that one before. Um, the, I would tell a student uh, entering the field um, or in college or medical school to learn all the medicine you can and need to, obviously, but also to understand that the best things come from interfaces. So learn something in depth in some other areas that you can apply to ophthalmology, whether that's material science or genetics or computer science, uh, big data, informatics, um, nanotechnology. There are so many cool things happening in the broader world of science and business and economics and uh, computers that I think if you can bring those advances into ophthalmology we can really turbocharge our field and do some fascinating things in the eye. So uh, look at interfaces that you're interested in and uh, learn about them and do something cool with that knowledge. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. I could uh, easily do uh, what I'm doing in terms of practice and research and, and outreach for uh, another three decades or more. Um, in terms of potential next jobs, I, um, I think uh, doing what my chairman uh, did, Dr. Olson did, build a, a new department from scratch would be something cool. Uh, if there was a new medical school somewhere that wanted to really build a, an excellent uh, world-class department of ophthalmology, that could be fun. Um, if my company, Ivina, which uh, is a startup uh, that my brother and I started to um, transform eye care uh, by bringing our discoveries from the lab into the clinic, if that takes off, I think I could foresee a larger amount of my time in product development um, and really translating those uh, discoveries into uh, impact enabling procedures and drugs. Um, and uh, if it takes off and does really well and we have resources, my brother and I, uh, you know, we, do, we did and do have a dream for building an eye clinic one day in India and if we could prepone that from the end of our career to our mid-career, that, that would be interesting and, and, and important as well.